Lovely. Well, welcome everyone to this afternoon's Heritage Volunteering Group Masterclass. So this is part two of a session around ethics in volunteer management. For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Rhiannon and uh, one of your co-hosts for today. And we also have Will, who will be supporting with all the technical uh, stuff in the background. Uh, so we're all in good hands. So what we're going to do today, um, we held a session back in March, if, if people can remember, where we um, were introduced to ethics in volunteer management. What we're going to do in this session is to pick up that uh, conversation and really think about its application and how we can use that theory more practically. So we're joined once again by our very esteemed colleagues, uh, Katie Campbell and Rob Jackson. Uh, you all should have seen their bios in the uh, email that went out. So um, I will leave it there, but um, it should be a really, really exciting, quite engaging session. This session's a little bit longer than normal. So it's about an hour and a half to make sure we've got adequate time for chatting amongst each other um, and making sure that we can really drill down into the detail of the application of, of this ethics theory. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Katie. If you have any questions or queries throughout the session, as we've said, pop them in the chat and Will and I will uh, pick them up as we go. Handing over to you, Katie. Thanks ever so much for being with us today. Okay, see if I have the power yet. I don't think I do to share my screen. Will, our technical Will, uh, will, will <laughs> be on that for us. <laughs> there we go. Okay, great. Well, it's um, wonderful to be here back again for part two. Um, and There, okay. So um, we're going to start with a really, really quick recap for those of you who might not have joined us the, for the first session uh, and also because it was a while ago. So this isn't ex exactly stuff you've been thinking about all this time, I'm sure. So just to sort of get us all on the same page again, um, just a, a couple of slides to um, recap what we talked about in the first session. <clears throat> so we talked about the this word ethics and what it means, how we define it. Um, the definition that I like to use is that it is a set of principles that defines behavior as right, good, and proper. And this comes from the internationally renowned Josephson Institute for Ethics that has been around for a long time and done a lot of research in ethics um, internationally, globally, and across many different professions. It's important to remember that ethics and values are not exactly always the same. So we can have a value, personally, I value um, being on time for meetings, but that is not one of those principles that defines behavior as good or right. It's I think it's a good way to behave, but it isn't, um, it's, it's not necessarily a right wrong kind of um, value. There are other values such as respect, which yes, that kind of, uh, that is an ethical value. So we can have some values that are not, not necessarily ethical values, but we're gonna um, focus on the ethics uh, today. And, um, that ethics mean different things to different people. We'll say a little bit more of that in a second. Um, and at the heart of ethical dilemmas and situations which do involve ethics, um, the reason they are so difficult to navigate is because there's a clash and a conflict between two important ethical values or principles. And, and yet we're, we're caught between them. And that's why we have difficulty with those kinds of situations. So because ethics is kind of a, a squishy complex issue to talk about and to think about, um, we like to 
use a very simple concept that we all can understand. And that is to think of ethics as a backpack that each of us carries with us all the time. Your ethics backpack is part of who you are and it influences how you behave. And it is very deeply personal and it's unique to you. Yes, I can have some of the same things in my backpack that you have in yours, but other content can be very different. And therefore, we can never assume that two people's ethical backpacks are exactly the same. Um, we can't make those kinds of assumptions at all because it's, it's a very, very personal part of each of us. So what's in this backpack? There are three types of ethics that we carry around with us. The first is our personal ethics. This is my own, it's very subjective, and it is influenced by my own personal history, my ex life experience, perhaps my religious beliefs, um, perhaps my ethnic background or culture. It guides my immediate reaction to things around me. So that's the first voice that pops into my head when I encounter an ethical dilemma is my personal ethics voice. Um, and that's the part that, again, uh, can be one thing to me and something very different for you. The second kind of ethics we carry around with us, if we are part of an organization, either our employer or somewhere we volunteer, are organizational ethics. So many organizations, nonprofits and NGOs and businesses these days have a code of ethics. And um, that is because they need to ensure consistency among all the people associated with that, with that group, with that organization. Rather than leaving things up to each person to behave according to their own ethics and their own values, the organization puts out there some parameters, some ethical values and principles. And when we're associated with that organization, either as an employee or as a volunteer, we are agreeing to abide by those values and those rules. And then the third type of ethics are professional ethics. And that's the one that we're focusing on here today. Many, uh, when, when you hear the phrase professional ethics, you might very well think of medical professionals, uh, legal professionals, accountants, uh, lawyers, doctors, uh, uh, they've, they've all had professional ethics for decades and centuries even. Um, in our field uh, and with NGOs, we, we now have uh, fundraising professionals who have codes of ethics. And we as leaders of volunteer management and, and engagement, um, we have a code of professional ethics as well. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So as I shared in the last session, um, the Council for Certification and Volunteer Administration years ago uh, came up with uh, a set of ethical values for volunteer engagement professionals. And it is built around these five core values. Now you might wonder where these core values came from. They actually come from the work of that Josephson Institute of Ethics that I mentioned earlier. Um, the Institute did some extensive international research uh, several decades ago where they um, actually determined that all kinds of people everywhere agree on a set of core ethical values, which uh, Josephson called the pillars of character. And these universal values, it's amazing to think that people all over the world actually agree on a set of core prin principles and values. They don't all use this exactly the same words, but it boils down to um, the same thing. So these, uh, these core values from the Josephson Institute have been adopted by many professions as the basis for their codes of ethics and um, CCVA adopted it for our field as well. Now there's a, a handout um, that is available. I think that was sent out to you beforehand and um, it summarizes this in detail, a one page. So I'm not gonna go through it in detail now, but I would 
urge you to keep it in front of you for this session because you'll want to refer to it as we come back to our um, discussion. So it's five core values and within core of each core value, there are three principles which elaborate more on what that value is. So just to, uh, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory if you um, look at the handout, but for instance, the value of respect um, is that administrators and volunteers acknowledge the inherent value skills and abilities of all individuals and affirms the mutual benefit gained by both the volunteer and the organization. And within that, it talks about the principle of dignity, you know, uh, upholding the right of all volunteers to be involved in the decisions that affect them, inclusivity, which means refers to encouraging participation of people from diverse backgrounds and abilities. And then the principle of privacy, which is about obviously protecting confidential information. So I think a lot of this will sound very familiar to you and does, um, but it's it, the framework here is what we use as a starting point when we are navigating um, ethical dilemmas. So that brings us to the new content now starting for today, which is we're going to focus on, as Rihanna said, um, the more practical application of those core values and principles in our everyday life and how we can use that framework um, as a basis to go through an, an actual decision-making process when we are confronted with an ethical dilemma. These are the steps that um, CCVA recommends for us to follow. And this is not unique to our profession. Um, if you read other materials and resources out there about ethics and ethical decision-making, you will see this same uh, chain of, of decision-making steps um, or something very similar to it. So it is, it is very, a very common process that is used by many, many people. As we get into it today, I think you will begin to see how using this process is, is very helpful and beneficial in lots of ways. The steps in general, we're gonna walk through in a second more in more detail, but using these steps, first of all, it promotes a fuller understanding of the situation. Um, it helps us to avoid that knee-jerk reaction based on our own personal bias or our personal ethics and, and forces us to kind of slow things down and take some time to think things through before we respond or before we act. This process also encourages creative thinking and, and the gathering of multiple perspectives about possible solutions and possible ways we could respond. Um, one thing we wanna try very hard to avoid is responding to an ethical situation simply all alone by ourselves. We need to gather input and ideas and creative thoughts um, from other people. Sometimes people involved in the situation, but also some people, sometimes people who are not directly involved can be very, very helpful. So this process encourages that. It, it also provides a very safe way to explore various options of response and various actions that you could take um, without making, before you make a decision, it, it allows you to explore the pros and cons of those um, in a very safe way uh, where nobody, nobody gets hurt and, and nothing is, is done and no action is taken until you're ready. And then finally, what I really appreciate about this process is that following this steps results in a decision that is defensible. So if someone questions my actions afterwards um, and says, why did, you, why did you do that, Katie? That wouldn't be the way I would have handled that situation. I can feel confident and sharing the process that I went through to make that decision. Now, there's no guarantee that my decision is 100% correct all the time, or that there weren't um, you know, 
possibly have been another way that I could have responded, but I can, I can sleep better at night knowing that at least I have a rationale for, the, for why I did what I did. And mapping it out like this um, is really, really helpful to have um, in case you are questioned in the future. I want to also just emphasize that, um, as I said, it's you know when we when we have these kind of situations, we're we want to find the absolute right answer. That's that's what we always kind of naturally want to to believe is that there is a right answer here, and I just have to figure out what it is. But the reality is that each situation is unique, and often the course of action we take will have some negative consequences and some, thing, some consequences that are simply unavoidable. And so what we, what we need to keep in mind is that our goal needs to be to make the best decision with the best information we can get at the time and be clear about why we're making that decision and then be prepared for any potential negative implications. Sometimes someone will get hurt or the organization gets um, hurt in the process of resolving the uh, dilemma or the situation, but we want the least possible negative implications and, and results and the most positive that we can get. So perfection is not necessarily an option, unfortunately, but um, again, this process can really help us to feel confident in what we finally decide to do. So going through these steps just in a little bit more detail. And again, there's a, there's a handout here that I think has been popped into the, the link to it has been popped into the chat that um, lays out these decision-making steps. So you will have them in front of you again as we move into the breakout sessions. Um, first step is to gather more information. So you'll hear about the situation from somebody, but um, that's not the whole story necessarily. So we need to find out who else is involved in this situation, what led to it, and, and really dig for as much uh, information as we have, as we can get what's unique about this situation, um, get multiple perspectives on what happened and uh, what the facts are. Also finding out if there are any relevant policies that maybe relate to this situation. The second step, is to actually name the conflict, name the values or principles, ethical values or principles that are at the heart of this. Where's the tension? There is tension here. That's why it's so difficult to navigate. So we wanna name those, looking at that CCVA framework of um, the core app value and principles, that first handout, looking at those and saying, okay, where, what's the, which of these are involved in this situation? The third step is then to explore those options that I mentioned earlier. So to, to think about what are the, the various things that ways that I could respond to this situation. Usually you can quickly come up with a couple of different um, possible things that you can do. Um, but again, talking with other people uh, may generate some additional possible options. And for each option, we want to think about the pros and cons of each one. If I did this, what would happen? If I did that, what would be what would happen? Who would be most affected by it? Um, we want to make sure we think about our, if there are any legal implications to any of those possible actions. Um, and and then we want to ultimately look for the path or the option for action that generates the least harm. So again, as I said, there, there may be some negative, some harm that comes out of it for an individual or for the organization, but we wanna choose the path of least harm. And then we, have, we are ready to act, but before we do, we want to test that decision. And there's a number of ways that this can be done. Um, what I like is to use the click method. This has been around a long time. Um, I didn't invent this, but I've used it myself. And I think it's lovely and simple and really helps you to feel confident in your decisions. So the first, the C is for consequence. 
So again, being really clear about what are, what are the consequences if I do this, who will benefit, who will suffer. Second L is for legal. Are there any consequences, legal consequences, if I do this? Am I, and if there are, am I okay with that? I think, you know, we could all think of situations in history um, and maybe more recently where someone broke the law, but they did it because they believed that ethically it was the right thing to do. So being ethical and being legal are not always the same. Thank goodness, I think most of the time they are, <laughs> but sometimes they're not. And so if we're going to take an action that is violating a law, um, we can choose to do that. We just need to go into it with our eyes open and realize that that is going to be um, one of the consequences. The I is for image. And that is about, is this going to harm our, the public image of myself or our organization? Um, if we put this in current terms, you can ask yourself, would I be comfortable seeing this decision announced in the newspaper or on Facebook? Okay. Um, this, that particular one has been an important checkpoint for me in the past in my decision making. Um, and, and I remember one case in which it really stopped me and made me pause and think, Ooh, yeah, I feel okay about this in the privacy of my own office, but am I comfortable with this going public? Mm, I don't know that I am. And so that made me step back and, and reevaluate a little bit. Um, culture, does this decision support or damage our organization's culture and values? And then the, the K is for not. Does this action cause a knot in my stomach? So it, this is your gut, your gut check. And we know in our field, in our profession, we, we rely on our gut sometimes and we need to. Um, so this is the time for the gut, gut check is that not, that K for not. Um, on a gut level, emotionally, would my parents approve? Would my mentor approve? Would my children approve? So it's, it's sort of just um, checking that emotional uh, reaction and, and uh, how you feel about it from that standpoint. So those are the decision-making steps. Um, after you have made your decision and tested it, then it's time to act with courage, confidence, and professionalism. Again, there may not be a 100% guarantee that you've made the right decision, but you'll be able to justify your actions because you followed a rational, thoughtful process that took into account all the contents of your ethical backpack, not just your personal ethics, not just the organizational ethics, but your professional ethics as well. Mm -hmm.